topic for tonight is knee replacement, maximizing your results. And when I say maximizing your results, uh, this really is a team effort. It's not only the, the, the surgeon that you choose and the team that does this at the hospital and your therapist, but you probably are the biggest part in what happens in your outcome, um, no matter what happens. And so I wanna go through some of that, but the key to this whole talk is gonna be educating yourself about what's wrong with your knee, uh, what the knee replacement really entails, and what your part is in it to make the best result that you possibly can. So what we want to do is answer a couple questions through tonight, and I think this talk maybe will take 25, 30 minutes, leave some time for us to talk a little bit and answer questions. But the first topic is basically what is arthritis of the knee? Uh, after that, we'll go on to what are the non-surgical treatment options, because obviously most of us don't want to go to surgery if we don't have to, and most of the patients we see when they first present uh, we've got m multiple options to try to avoid the surgical side. Uh, then, what is a knee replacement if you really need it? And what are the different options in knee replacements? You guys in this day and age are being bombarded from everywhere in the literature. Uh, everybody's got a product to sell now. Uh, the manufacturers, the hospitals, even the physicians, you'll see us out there. In fact, we've got some mailing pieces going out uh, coming in the future here. Uh, and then next, how do I educate myself and lastly, am I ready if it's really time to do it? So those are the topics we'll hit. You know, if you look in the dictionary, textbooks, things like that, there are multiple definitions of arthritis, but basically my simple definition is chronic or long-term damage to the knee that causes symptoms. And symptoms are basically what you're feeling. Uh, just an example here, this is a, a picture of an arthroscopy when we put a little scope inside a knee and look. The normal knee will have on the top bone here a very smooth cartilage surface that we call the articular surface. And then we'll have a little uh, disc that sits in here called the meniscus. And you can see how nice, even though the knee is being stretched a little bit, so we'll have a little uh, fold in it there, but normally it's kind of taut. And then the bone below called the tibia has a real beautiful or smooth articular surface as well. And you can see how nice that looks. And I tell patients in the office, hey, your knee should look like it's ivory on, covering on the end of the bone right there. Here's an arthroscopy of a knee where, boy, that femur sure looks different. It looks like you're looking at the moon right there as you look at it where there's so much damage to the joint surface where it's been chipping off, wearing away. Uh, the cartilage looks almost a yellow stain. There's degenerative changes in it. And even the joint surface on the tibia looks that way as well. So you can certainly see when we look inside a knee, and of course arthroscopic, uh, it's uh, a little magnified when you see it that way. But certainly are there some substantial changes that occur in the knee when it's arthritic. For instance, if you come in the office and we show you an x-ray, a normal knee is going to have very smooth joint surfaces, nice joint space in there, a great looking x-ray. But if you start to get arthritis like you are on the inner side of the knee right here, you get this increased whiteness or density because of the wear. The bone's trying to strengthen itself. You'll lose the joint space in there. You'll start to develop spurs. Um, so that's kind of what arthritis looks to us on the x-ray. And you can certainly see that a lot of changes are occurring there. Well, when we talk about the symptoms, what do patients experience? Certainly, what brings you in the office primarily is usually pain. It doesn't have to be, but it's usually the number one complaint. Uh, the pain can be constant. The pain can be made, uh, maybe just with activity. It can be at nighttime. Uh, patients will have a, a, a varied complaint about what they talk about uh, when they come in. Uh, stiffness. Um, uh, patients will say, if I sit down for a period of time, my knee will get stiff, I have to get up and walk it out, or when I get out of bed first thing in the morning, it's awful stiff to me. Or I can't straighten it out anymore, I can't flex it all the way back anymore, it's gotten too tight on me. Um, patients will feel grinding in there, sometimes you'll hear it. Uh, even when you get a little bit like myself and I go up and down the stairs, my kids will go, oh my gosh, that sounds so bad, Dad, I don't want to go behind you there. So, uh, you know, you may have a family member that hears and say, hey, what is that? Um, but definitely you can feel it and you can hear it when it starts. Um, swelling. Um, for instance, here you can see a knee. patient might present to the office and say, wow, all of a sudden my knee's gotten so much bigger and stiff and it hurts. And here you can see, although they've had some surgery there, <coughs> um, in this normal knee, you can see the outline of the kneecap right there. But here it's like, wow, where's the kneecap? So the knee joint has a big old pouch in there and it can fill up with fluid. You know, normally the knee has fluid to lubricate the joint, but when it senses something's not quite right in there mechanically, it'll produce more fluid trying to lubricate that joint. And so 
a lot of patients will experience swelling and it can be pretty severe at times and become quite painful because of that. Um, deformity, you know, normally the knee um, will have a certain amount of just a little bit of knock knee in it. Women are a little bit more than men, but that's just the way we're put together. And if the inner side of the knee tends to wear a little bit more than the outer side, then we get this bow-leggedness that you can see there. Um, or if the outer side wears more than the inner side, then you can see where we get this knock knee uh, where the knees kind of come together. And some patients can wait a long time, and it's pretty amazing to me just how deformed they come into the office sometimes. And, and the worse the deformity gets, obviously, the harder it gets to walk, the more energy it takes to walk, and the more pain usually that, that occurs with it. So basically, that's kind of what arthritis is to the knee in a nutshell, um, what it is and how it presents and what it feels like. So once we've got the patient in the office and we've made the diagnosis and gone over that, well, you know, what are our options? And if we start with non-surgical options, which you all see related here, um, and then we get down to the surgical options, I'll just kind of move through this. One of the main things that we want to do is we want to get the patient on an exercise program or in physical therapy. And the reason for that is, is that once you start to get arthritis and your activity level starts to go down or you start to favor the extremity, the problem becomes that the, the joint starts to get weaker and it starts to get more stiff. So the hallmark of this, what we really want to do is we want to maintain motion or if we can get some of it back because the better you keep the motion, the less symptomatic that knee will be. And the stronger you get, the more stress you'll take off of that damaged joint. So those are the things we're really trying to do when we give you exercises, where we put you in a physical therapy program uh, to work on that. Of course, physical therapy can also do some treatments with some of you may have experienced with the electrical stimulation, the ultrasound, uh, the treatments to try to get the inflammation down, the swelling down, and the soreness as well. Um, also, uh, usually as a first line of treatment, we'll try some sort of medication, uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like a, an Aleve or an Advil over the counter or something stronger like a Mobic, Meloxicam, Celebrex, Relafin, uh, Voltaire, and Lodine. There's a bunch of them on the market. Um, and sometimes they can be very effective. Sometimes one not, may not be as effective as for a certain patient as another, but they certainly are worth trying as long as you're having symptoms to knock those symptoms down a little bit because it's the inflammation in the joint that causes a lot of that pain that's in there. Um, another can be steroids. We try not to overdo that orally. Um, certainly, if you have an inflammatory arthritis, and I'm not really going to get deeply into is this osteoarthritis or rheumatoid or something like that, but in the rheumatoids or lupus, you know, they may need to be on higher powered medicines like a steroid, uh, like a methotrexate or something like that. But the stronger you get, obviously, the more side effects. So we have to deal with that as, a, as an issue as well. And once again, that's a little beyond the talk. When it gets into medicines like that, we usually get you over to our rheumatologic friends, one of the rheumatologists. Uh, pain medicine, obviously, sometimes we need to give you something over the counter, the Tylenols, the Advils, the Aleve. Uh, we try to go non-narcotic if we can. There are some prescription strength medicines like that now. And then lastly, a narcotic, although we just want to do that for breakthrough pain and not have to make that a mainstay of your treatment. Um, topical medications, you may see a lot of that um, being out in the, in the literature that you're seeing right now. Actually, we're doing a study in the office right now where we're comparing several uh, as one of a multi-center uh, participating in this. But basically, the anti-inflammatories in some sort of medium, whether it's a gel, whether it's a liquid, and then you rub it on the area to penetrate it down in. Certainly a lot of patients have issues with their stomach where taking it orally may be hard on the long term, but doing it topically may be very, very effective. So that's another form of medication we can do. Uh, obviously, um, injections are another thing. Usually we'll start with a, uh, a corticosteroid. Uh, some people will call it a steroid shot. Others will call it a cortisone shot. Um, it, it's, it's pretty much um, uh, uh, the same thing, really, whether it's steroid or cortisone. Uh, but we usually will use some medication and put it in. That's usually a short-term medicine. We're just trying to knock down the inflammation fairly rapidly. Uh, the medicine lasts maybe about three weeks. Uh, if we get to where it, it works, but then it wears off and it happens a few times, then we tend to go with uh, something a little longer acting, the hyaluronic acid. And you'll see the manufacturers, Synvisc, Orthovisc, uh, Hylogan, uh, Sue Parts, there's about five of them out there, I just named four, but 
um, they'll, they'll put um, advertisements in a lot of these magazines these days, and that can be highly effective. You know, we usually tell patients in general, uh, we think about 60% of the patients that have arthritis will respond to that and say, hey, that was a favorable event and even do it again, and it's something that we can repeat. The FDA will let us do that at six month intervals. So uh, those are something that's uh, very good to use uh, when we're treating arthritis as well. Bracing, you know, we talked about those deformities, the bow leg, the knock knee. Um, a lot of times, if we have a lot of pain on that side of the knee where the deformity is, for instance, this knee uh, is an, uh, a bow leg where uh, you get on there and you get a lot of um, pain in that inner side. Uh, what happens is we can use the brace to push that knee back in and get that alignment in a little bit more of a knock knee position. And what it does is it puts the pressure on the better part of the joint and leaves uh, or relieves the part of the joint that the most of the arthritis is in. Now these braces are a little tough to wear sometimes. They're custom made, um, but they can be very effective. Probably about 50% of the patients will say that that brace is effective for them to help get that pressure off that side of the knee and, and, and get the pain out. About 50% will say it didn't work much or they don't really tolerate the pressure that it puts on, but it can be very effective in a patient who wants to be up and walk a lot. We can also, besides using the unloader that I just talked about, use a supporter brace, just a little sleeve that provides a little warmth and a little compression. Sometimes that's all it takes to really help the patient get around a little bit better. And then we get into the surgical side of this thing where at times we might say, you know, the arthritis really isn't too bad at this point and we don't want to be so aggressive as to go to a knee replacement. So we might go to an arthroscopy where we put a couple little poke holes in the knee, use a little camera where we can watch on a screen and use little instruments that go inside the knee. And for instance, that damaged joint surface, it's real frayed and we call that looking like crab meat. We may come back and just smooth that up real, real well in there or take out some scar tissue or even loose pieces that may be floating around. So that's done where we just watch it on a screen, minimally invasive, three little poke holes, most of the time so small we don't even need stitches in it. But sometimes that can really help alleviate the discomfort. If the arthritis is too bad, usually you don't want to do that. It's a little controversial. There's been some literature that's bounced that around a little bit. But in a knee that's not that arthritic, that's pretty symptomatic, it is a pretty good option to at least give a try to, to delay going into knee replacement. The literature suggests out there that probably about 70% of the patients that are good candidates for that will get relief for upwards of three years if you do that. So basically you're really buying time when you do that, which a lot of times if the arthritis gets bad enough, that's what you're doing with most of these treatments. And then finally, um, when all else fails, we get into what we call knee replacement surgery. And under that category, um, there's going to be a lot of different topics that I'm going to present real quickly here. But the, the, the goal in that, uh, when you do knee replacement surgery, is a couple things. Number one, we really want to restore that motion. By the time the arthritis has gotten so bad, usually patients have what we call contractures. They can't straighten the knee all the way out. They can't bend it all the way. It really affects their functional capability. And if you can't straighten it all the way out when you walk, it does take more energy expenditure to walk. And so you wonder sometimes why you feel a little bit more exhausted, but the worse the arthritis gets and the more deconditioned you get as well and the more energy it takes to walk, it gets tougher and tougher and harder and harder. We also want to get in there, we want to remove spurs and take out loose bodies, pieces that are floating around and they're free. We want to get out the scarring. Um, we want to resurface or put a new covering on the end of the joint and that's what basically joint replacement is. And lastly, we want to restore alignment. Once again, a lot of people will come in with a, a bowed leg or a, a knock kneed leg, and we want to try to get that back into a more normal alignment. So what are the different options in implants? And for us, once again, the strategy is we want to choose the implant that best matches the pathology. So basically what we're doing is when we make a decision and we look at you and we examine you and look at your x-rays and and any other things that we need to look at, we're trying to figure out what's the type of implant that's gonna give you the best result and how do we do that? So um, usually we just don't say, hey, go to surgery, it's over with, and that's it. There's a lot of thought press process that actually does go into this. One of the topics is how many compartments do we replace? The knee is actually three compartments, the compartment underneath the kneecap, the inside part of the knee, and the outside part of the knee. 
So if all we do is replace one of those three compartments, we call it a unit compartment replacement, and all we really want to do is kind of fix what's damaged. So if two of the compartments are good, heck, don't go fixing those. I mean, that's good. We just want to fix the one that's bad. If two of the compartments are bad, then we'll go ahead and fix that. And if all three compartments are bad, we'll do what we call a total knee replacement. So the term total just means that we're going to fix all three compartments. And sometimes that's confusing. When you say total, you think, and, and we have patients come in almost every day and say, so you're going to take my whole knee out and put a whole new knee in. Well, I'll go through this. That's not really what we do. Total just really means that we're going to work on three compartments. So a unit compartmental replacement, in this case, we're going to say, hey, the inside part of the knee is the bad part, but all the ligaments uh, are good in the center of the knee, and this doesn't show the side ligaments, but all the damage is on the inside. The kneecap's not too bad. So all we want to do is really concentrate and replace the bad compartment. So in this case, we'll put a little ceramic or a metal cap on the end of the bone on the top bone of the femur, and we'll put, primarily we use now just a plastic spacer, but we might use a little metal tray with a plastic spacer to go on the bottom bone. And basically what we're doing is we're calling that resurfacing or replacing that part of the joint. Sometimes when we do unit compartmentals, um, we might even do that with an arthroscopy because the patient may have a little wear underneath the kneecap, but not bad enough that we want to replace that. And we may go in and do a little light cleaning in there and then do the unit compartment on the inside. But with the unit compartments, we can do the inside part of the knee, the outside part of the knee, or underneath the kneecap. And here's what it looks like radiographically once it's in there. Uh, you can still see, hey, we left a lot of the normal joint in position right there. So if at all we can do that, we sure like to do that versus anything more aggressive. The bicompartmental replacement, we're replacing underneath the kneecap and we're replacing to the inner side or the outer side, and then we've got the bottom right there replaced as well. But same thing, in a bicompartmental replacement, we'll keep all the ligaments of the knee, we'll keep the um, cartilage to the outside part, in this case, uh, we'll keep all the joint surface and the bone there, and the more bone and ligament that we can preserve, the better off, because sometimes, and I'm not really gonna get into this heavily, but sometimes down the road, 10, 15, 20 years, we may have to replace that, and the more we have to work with, boy, the better it off it is for us as the surgeon, but you as the patient as well. And then lastly, a total knee replacement, which once again just means all three compartments. So here we put a little button on the kneecap. Um, there's a little plastic button behind that. We've got a component that fits completely around the top bone, and we've got a component that fits on the bottom bone. So that's looking at the knee straight on, and that's looking at it from the side. And here we have no um, remainder of the joint touching itself. So the whole joint has been resurfaced. So now everything is metal against plastic when we do the total. Uh, incision, um, a couple years ago, there was a big push to do what we call minimally invasive uh, surgery on that. And we used to do what we call a standard incision. And we kind of got caught up in the hoopla of that. We participated in a study with that. Um, and I'll kind of give you my thoughts on that as well. But in a standard incision, we're gonna make an incision up and down the front of the knee from the little bump on the lower bone to up above the kneecap right there. So the green line kind of represents the straight line we'll make on the skin. The blue line will represent, we have to come into the side of the kneecap to be able to get in. But in a standard incision, we took that incision straight up right into the quadriceps muscle right along the tendon. Most of us um, pretty much will curve into the tendon. We don't wanna get in the muscle there. If we do a more minimally invasive surgery, basically what we're trying to do is not go as deep here, make a, a, a more smaller skin incision, but then we go right up underneath the in, lower part of the quadriceps there called the vastus medialis, or go directly in the mid vastus, which is what I was doing, or go a little higher up into there. You know, there are definitely trade-offs because um, in a patient that's a little larger size, it's a much, much more difficult approach uh, it, it can sometimes be fraught with a little bit higher incidence of a nerve problem as well. Um, it looks better when the scar is smaller, obviously. Um, so that, that's kind of the nice thing. And it was thought that the recovery was quicker. And I think, in fact, probably um, in the first couple of weeks it may be, but even by six weeks it's very, very hard to tell. Uh, we kind of ran a little uh, test for a while with one of my partners. We would do two replacements. I'd do one, he'd do the other side. I'd do the standard incision, but through a smaller skin incision, but we'd go up into the quad tendon, 
he would do the, the uh, vastus splitting incision and we'd always try to guess when they came back in, we'd have the nurses and the medical students and residents, whoever was with us, try to say wh whose knee was who. And um, I, I, I was biased. I think they couldn't tell the difference, but that was my bias, but I think that was the case. Um, what we did is, and um, we, we just tried to make them smaller and smaller, and uh, we even got to the point, we, one day we did one at about two and a half inches, and the lady loves her incision, but my, my surgical scrub, who scrubs with us on every case, said, we well, you know it looks pretty good, but it took a whole half uh, half hour extra. So you put, put her through all that more uh, anesthesia and everything else. Was it really worth it? And I scratched my head and said, "Well, uh, probably not." But she still likes her incision. So uh, the problem is, if you make them too small, you actually tear the skin sometimes, and then you get a little funny. They used to call it the J for Jansen, but we were tearing skin a little bit. So we said, "Okay, we just got to make that skin incision a little bit bigger." So. Bottom line is, I've been rambling on about that. What we try to do is a balance. We make it as small as we can um, and just use what we need, but basically the size of the knee and the implant really is what dictates the size of the incision. So if you see minimally invasive, most guys now are making much smaller incisions. Uh, the equipment has gotten so much better where the instrumentation is so much smaller, it's easier to, to get that done than it used to be. Uh, you'll hear talk about materials. Um, for the most part, they're pretty standard. Most of these metals now are cobalt chrome in the knee because they have to take a lot of bearing on it. Titanium's uh, been shown to be a, been a great metal with what we do in orthopedics, but it, it sloughs off too much uh, of the material, so we usually use primary cobalt chrome. Um, we do use a, a, another implant that has a, a ceramic called oxenium. Um, at least in the lab, they're touting that it may do better uh, we've not proven that clinically, so uh, it's still up in the air about that. The biggest uh, improvements have been in this plastic component of the polyethylene where uh, we've been able to cross-link it, meaning that we've been able to make it stronger so it wears less. And certainly our longevity or implants are going in. When I first started practice 20 years ago, we said, hey, we hope these last 10 to 12 years. Now we're saying, hey, we hope they last 15 to 20. And there are studies with older generation implants that are showing maybe even upwards of 90% of the implants put in 20 years ago are, are still around. So we are getting much, much better um, with all that. It's probably not strictly related to materials, but techniques and other things uh, also. Bonding, you'll hear cemented implants, cementless implants, or a combination. Most everybody is using cement now, just kind of like you would go to the dentist and have a crown or cap put on where they cement it on. That's pretty much what we're doing. Once we make these cuts and we put the trials on and we like the fit and the way it goes, we'll wash off the surface. Uh, we'll put the cement on the end of the surface and then put the implant on, uh, put the other ones on and hold it still until it hardens. Basically, it takes us maybe five minutes at most for that to harden. Uh, sometimes it's a race, you know, my tech gets a little rambunctious and gets it where it might harden in three minutes. He's like, you better get going. And I think he's got to go to lunch or bathroom when he does that to me. But uh, anyway, we, we, we get it done in time. But uh, that cement's just as hard as it's going to be before you get out of there and, and that implant's very stable. The reason for the cementless was we were trying to improve, long, improve longevity and we thought if we could put a surface on that implant and the bone would grow into it, uh, that that would be better for the long haul. Uh, it would be easier to revise, but that's really not been shown the case. Uh, there were a lot of people that tried to do a blend because the tibia was hard to get the bone and grow into. The femur was real easy, so they would cement there and go cementless there. But once again, pretty much everybody's cementing these knees these days. Um, every once in a while, you see a little resurgence of someone wanting to go cementless, but that's really not going to be much of a help. Uh, you might hear about cruciate retaining versus cruciate sacrificing. All that means is, is that the posterior cruciate, there are two ligaments in the center of the knee. The one in the front is the anterior cruciate, the one in the back is the posterior. For all implants that's a total knee, the anterior cruciate has to go out. The posterior cruciate um, is the one that either we leave or take. We used to, I was always trained to leave the posterior cruciate because it would give a more stable knee, but you wouldn't get as much bend. If you took the posterior cruciate, you get a lot more bend. Now these posterior cruciates, sacrificing knees, give us the best of both worlds, better bend and good stability. So a lot of people have really gone to that now. Um, so we're getting better from that standpoint. Um, once again, two types. You can have a little post in here that gives you the stability, or you can build up the lip in them is how that's done. 
Gender specific, it's become a very hot topic. Zimmer plastered that all over the place, convinced a lot of women they had to have their knee because it was specific for females. And in fact, um, females are usually with these systems easier to fit than the males are. The males are the ones that we have the trouble with because the sizing from front to back and width wise is very, very difficult sometimes and if you got a big male. And we've really had very little difficulty with females, but in fact, What's happened, all these companies have taken their implants and given us so many different sizes to work with that we can size that right there in the OR and get almost a perfect fit every time. So um, the gender specific, yeah, it was a great marketing scheme, but uh, in reality, it's not really panned out um, like we thought it would with all the implants being able to duplicate that and give us multiple sizes. So with all that said, and I've thrown so much out at you because this is what we're thinking about from the surgical side. What's the bottom line? And the reason for so much variability is a reflection of the multiple techniques and implants that work to achieve the goals of both the physician and the patient. And I think the, the real true bottom line is you really have to trust your physician to handle each one of these issues that we just talked about. It's nice if you really want to get educated and you want to read about it and patients will come in and quiz me and come in with a big sheet of paper and we'll go through that. Um, but when it's all said and done at the end of the day, you really have to trust your physician to handle each one of these issues for you and figure out what he thinks is going to be the best implant. Um, I do think it's very valuable to spend time educating yourself on what you can do to get the best result. And then how do you educate yourself? I think first, once again, when you're in the office, you have to have your physician explain your diagnosis and your treatment options um, and go through that in a lot of detail. At that point, maybe get some educational materials from the office. That's why we have Susie in the office developing all this. We've done a poor job as a physician community to give you what you need to kind of arm yourself. And we've always thought, well, you know, the sophistication that we're going to present you, we can get in a lot of detail about those things that I went over but we can kind of simplify it too. And I think that's what we're trying to do in this day and age, um, you know, because once again, you know, if you asked me to build a house, I'd say, well, I wouldn't know where to start, you know, and you shouldn't be able to know how to put a replacement in, but we should at least give you some good educational materials to go over that. Um, I can't tout this joint class well enough at Crestwood. I think they do a phenomenal job. And each patient that we register to go to surgery here, they have a joint replacement class. And, and the education that you get there, I think, is just invaluable um, for, for what they do. And if you choose to go to another hospital, they all have them, Huntsville Hospital, you know, the other outlying hospitals, or whether you're in Birmingham or Nashville. But those, I think, are invaluable classes. Uh, there's time to ask questions from the coordinator that's doing it, and it's just a great resource. I think you want to talk to other patients who have undergone total knee replacement. Uh, Susie's compiled a list of some patients in our office, including Mr. House there, that some patients, you know, we know what it looks like from a physician standpoint. I've not had a total knee. I've not laid in that bed the next day. Uh, I've not had to use the pump. I've not had to argue with the therapist about making me get up uh, or the nurse that says, uh, you got to do this. So I, I think it's just so invaluable to get somebody else's perspective that's been through it. Um, and, and that's just, you know, great. Um, I wouldn't put a total knee in without someone else teaching me how to do it. So I think from a patient perspective, if you can find somebody that will talk to you about it, I think it's a wonderful thing. And search the internet. The internet's become kind of a, a, a beautiful tool, but yet uh, it can be tough. Uh, my hardest part is is some patients search it too hard and they come up with these things where someone's trying to market something and in their mind they think I've got to have that but yet that's not appropriate for them and sometimes that can be very difficult. So search, search the internet with an open mind. I mean go out there and try to find things. There's so much out there. We've Susie's put a lot of videos out there. Our, our group has, multiple groups have. Uh, the companies have things. You can look them up on their websites. Uh, but there's so much information, easy access. Um, I, I think it's a great tool. Uh, you know, I look at the internet uh, all the time. I'll go out there and look in some of our journals and find things that I need very rapidly and easily. Uh, the world has certainly changed when it comes to information access now. Uh, so I think it's a valuable tool, but I'll caution you, don't beat up on us too hard if we don't quite say what you think after you've looked at that. Um, why get educated? I think the more you understand, the more likely you're, you're able to participate in your care. 
And still, even though we try to educate patients so well, uh, I have patients that will come in the hospital, um, their expectations aren't quite right. Uh, they get in the hospital and they just think, oh, I can have the knee done and that's all I have to do when that's just half the battle. Uh, the other part of the battle is, is the patient has to participate and do their part to get a good result. And if they do, it can be a very, very rough road, not only in the patient, but on the family, um, any other people involved in the care, including the physician, it's a tough time. So I think the better educated you are, the better you'll participate in your care. The better per you participate in your care, once, once again, the more likely you'll have a better result. And I tru truly believe that at the bottom of my heart. So are you ready? If you and the audience, if you need a replacement or you know somebody that needs a replacement, I think these are the three questions you have to ask yourself. Have you educated yourself enough to feel confident in the diagnosis and the treatment plan? Are you mentally up for the challenge? Because it is a challenge. And are you in optimum physical condition? In other words, not only medically does your primary care physician or your cardiologist have you in good shape, but also we might have to have you doing some preoperative x-rays or exercises rather and try to build up some strength and, and get your endurance up a little bit that always can help. Once again, if you can answer to these three questions yes, then the probability of having a good result is very high. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, I have I'll get you. Yes, ma'am. And a bicep. Yes. I went to the orthopedic doctor and he said, well, those were secondary mm -hmm. to, I guess, the arthritis in the Gotcha. And I had to do a knee replacement. I just walked out. Gotcha. Gotcha. Because, you know, I don't think I'm that bad. Gotcha. As long as I can take the next step down, I'll work out. Gotcha. Um, Why can they not repair that meniscus and deal with that bicep? Right. Um, let me, let me address both those as kind of separate questions and then back to the arthritis question. Um, in an isolated meniscus tear, um, in your age category, and I don't want to call anybody old in here because I keep getting older too, but <laughs> um, we know that the meniscus has a very poor capability of healing. And so if it's an isolated meniscus tear and it's causing symptoms, usually we'll trim out that torn section and try to preserve just as much of the meniscus as we can. And that's how we treat an isolated meniscus tear. The Baker cyst is what he's getting at is that almost always if you have a Baker cyst, which it's just a benign cyst that's in the back of the knee where you fill it with some fluid from one of the tendon sheaths, almost always there's something else happening in the knee at the same time. So obviously you have a meniscus tear and something in the knee is irritating that to cause that cyst to get bigger and cause symptoms. So normally if you take care of whatever else is happening in there, we know that over 90% of the time that Baker cyst will go back down and become dormant. Um, sometimes there are isolated Baker, Baker cysts and you have to do things like drain them and things like that. If you have a lot of damage to the joint surface though and damage to the bone along with the meniscal tear and the Baker cyst, which is essentially some fairly significant arthritis, it's very difficult just to treat the meniscus only or the Baker cyst only. You almost have to treat the whole thing. But I think that most physicians would say that, well, you gotta take into account how much pain the patient's having, how functional they are, and, and all those things. And certainly, you know, different physicians treat things a little bit differently. But I, I totally agree with you. If your pain's not too bad and you're getting around pretty well, I would certainly try to manage the symptoms and do all we could to make you the best we could. But probably if your arthritis is too bad, going into the arthroscope and cleaning the meniscus wouldn't help. Maybe draining the cyst in the office might help you a little bit. But the bottom line is, is if the arthritis gets so bad, then you have to treat the whole thing, which would be a knee replacement if your arthritis is bad enough. So, okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I have, I've been going to an orthopedic doctor for a couple of years now. I have arthritis in both my knees. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think I'm about ready for a knee replacement mm -hmm. um, for both knees, but my doctor has never explained anything to me like he, like I have seen on this. Yes, ma'am. And he's never said anything about exercising except the mm -hmm. stationary bike. Okay, okay. So I think I should be maybe talking to someone else or get him to really sit with me, I've had right. steroid injections, okay. and they do help. Okay. 
but he won't give them to me but every four months right right and i've had one uh send this one okay uh, in each day yeah and that didn't seem to help as much but isn't that a jail that they put in yeah yes ma'am sure is well um what i'd probably suggest to you um i don't know if everybody in the back heard but She's got arthritis in both knees, and um, she's been through a lot of things, uh, some exercise, exercise bike, um, through the injections, uh, casual steroid, and um, the, the Simbisk one, or Simbisk injection, um, but has not talked to her about a knee replacement. You know, a lot of times, well, he ha excuse me, he has, has mentioned, I got but you. He hasn't explained anything. I got you. You know, a, a lot of times, um, what we'll do is we may not get into a bunch of detail. I, I know I don't unless I think you're to that point. And most of us, what we'll try to do is we'll try to run you through the gamut of all those non-surgical treatments and keep you going. And as long as you're doing okay with that, you know, we don't want to put you through a big surgery. But when it comes time and you say, you know what, um, the pain is too great or my activity level has just gone down so much, um, that's the time we usually will sit down and say, okay, uh, it's probably time to start talking about this knee replacement and going from there. I think what you can do as a patient, though, is you can say, you know, I've been through all this. Tell me about a knee replacement or what are my other options? And you may have to open that, that, that door a little bit and, and go from there. So I'd probably suggest, you know, giving your physician a shot at it and, say, and just doing that. Say, what else are my options? And maybe explain a knee replacement to me and, and how is that going to affect me uh, with what I've got? And... It doesn't hurt to get a second opinion if, if you don't get, you know, kind of enough information you want or the direction you want to go. So, sure. yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask Mr. House if he'd come up and just say a word or two, if you don't mind, um, maybe a little bit about his experience from the patient side, because uh, I've certainly, I, I haven't gotten a lot of detail about that. And then you all might have some questions you might want to ask him as well. I was in your shoes, all right? I, mm -hmm. I had pain every day of my life for 20 years. And I had pretty serious arthritis in my right knee. I went, I went to Dr. Jensen, and we tried the jail first. Uh, it, it seemed mentally it worked a little while. And then I went back to him, what, a year later maybe. Mm -hmm. And it was time. All right? I'm going to pass that around. It would That's swell up. Like. It would hurt That's every step. Going up black uh, steps, coming down steps. And... The next day it would be swollen. I went to Dr. Jackson and I said, it's yours, do what you can. And he did. Now, this is a year ago, all right? I, I mean, that, it's, it's something that changed my whole life after I had the surgery. Uh, I have to give thanks to this man right here because he knew what I needed as an individual. Did you have both knees replaced? I just want the right knee. My, my left one is pretty good, although we need to talk later. <laughs> uh, but all in all, uh, you, you go into the surgery, and, and maybe this is not a, you want to ask this question or not, but you go in with a super, super positive attitude. You can't be negative at any of it. You want to be healed of what pain you're going through, and, and it's worked. It really works. For more information on total knee replacement, contact Dr. Eric Jansen at SportsMed Orthopedic Surgery and Spine Center at 256-881-5151.